Hi, everyone. Welcome. And thanks, everyone, for uh, tuning in to this discussion today on data and um, the sustainable development goals. Uh, just to introduce myself quickly, I'm Catherine McIntyre. I'll be moderating today's discussion. Um, and I'm a reporter from The Logic, where I write about business and technology and the innovation economy, very broadly speaking. Um, and a big part of my job is to ask people who are much smarter than I am about the big ideas and problems and initiatives that they are grappling with and um, working on and that are shaping our changing economy and society. Uh, so today I'll be tur turning to this panel of experts to um, answer questions about data and the challenges and opportunities for solving um, some of the world's most pressing social, uh, environmental, and economic challenges we face today. Um, so with us, we have Jessica Espy. Jessica is a senior advisor to the UN uh, Sustainable Development Solutions Network, um, which promotes ways to implement the Sustainable Development Goals, or SDGs as uh, we'll refer to them. Um, and there she's also the director of trends where she leads the organization's work on data for sustainable development. Some of Jessica's current work looks at public private partnerships around data collection and use um, and how to govern those partnerships ethically. Um, also on the panel, we have Jonathan Dewar. Jonathan is the CEO of the First Nations Information Governance Center. Um, Part of the center's mandate is to ensure data sovereignty for First Nations across Canada using the OCAP principles. So this um, concept that First Nations have ownership, control, access, and possession of their own information. And these principles guide data governance for um, First Nations in this country. And last, we have Patrice Martino. Patrice is um, Chief of SDGs and International Activities at Statistics Canada. Um, and there he works on sustainable development, uh, the Sustainable Development Data Unit for StatsCan. Uh, his job involves working with the federal government on its national strategy for measuring Canada's progress on the SDGs. Um, so that includes finding the best ways to collect, analyze, and disclose data on um, the SDG indicators. So welcome everyone. Um, and uh, yeah, this uh, just briefly um, in, uh, before we dive into this topic, it's been about five years since 193 UN member states adopted um, these 17 goals that um, if they are achieved uh, would fundamentally change the world. So these are objectives to eradicate poverty and hunger, achieve gender equality, um, quality education for everyone, clean water for everyone, to improve the health of our environment. Um, and central to these goals is the tenet, uh, no one left behind. So to address the needs of everyone in the world, um, this massively ambitious goal, um, it requires, uh, you know, measuring how everyone is doing and then subsequently measuring progress that we're making on these hundreds of indicators that underlie these 17 goals. Um, and so to do that requires what uh, the high level panel that predated the SDGs called the need for a data revolution. Um, so that is to say new and more robust ways of collecting data, uh, analyzing it and governing it. Um, so these are all ideas that have been discussed since before 2015 when the SDGs were um, adopted, but over the last couple of years and especially now with COVID-19, um, these questions around data collection and governance have become um, even more urgent. So in this discussion, I wanna talk about you know, the progress with using data to gauge where we are and where we need to be in order to meet um, the deadline for the SDGs, which is 2030, so it's coming up. Um, and also talk about the risks associated with this data revolution. So it's a bit of a tall order, um, uh, so I'll just jump right into questions. Although um, I will say that, um, in just a bit of housekeeping first, we're gonna take questions from the audience uh, at the end of the discussion and um, throughout as well. So please just 
um, feel free to throw questions into the Q and A uh, chat um, at the bottom of the the page there. Um, and also, there is an interpretation button um, near the bottom if you you need interpretation for the discussion as well. Um, okay, so. I'm going to start with Jessica. Um, when we talk about this data revolution, my understanding is, you know, we need traditional data like survey and census information, but also new ways of gathering and using data. So can you talk about why new approaches are needed and um, what that looks like in the context of sustainable development and these goals? Sure. Um, thank you so much and lovely to be with you all today and thank you to everyone who's joining virtually. Um, yeah, so uh, it, it's a really good question. So a lot of people, when I say that I work on data and information systems on sustainable development, a lot of people say, well, why? I mean, we know where the population lives. We know how many people live in poverty. Um, we know um, the state of deforestation and so on. But the sad truth is um, that actually we really don't. A lot of what we think we know is based on very old data sets um, and model projections. Um, the reasons for that are very uh, logical. It's very expensive and timely and costly to do um, surveys, which is what the majority of our, our data sets worldwide are based on. Um, you know, go, literally going house to house um, to find out you know, information on people's well-being or their income or whatever is, is a very intensive process. And as such, they're only done intermittently and in low capacity countries done you know, far less than that. Um, you know, by way of example, um, the census, which is of course the biggest um, survey of the population that's done in most countries every 10 years to get an accurate population count. In many countries, um, it, it hasn't, it's never happened or it's, very, it's happened you know, very, very infrequently. In Afghanistan, for example, they've only had one partial census, which was in 1972. So um, there are huge gaps in our knowledge. And you know, when, when we give sort of figures of what's happening as of 2020, uh, we're likely basing that on projections. We're using old numbers and we're projecting them forward to figure out you know, the state of current conditions. But with, in the face of sustainable development, that's just not good enough. Uh, with climate change, with pandemics, as we're seeing now with COVID, um, with you know, the number of people that are dying on a daily basis as a result of diseases or poor health systems, we need real figures. We need to know what's actually happening now. And living in the digital era that we live in, there's no reason that we shouldn't be able to do that. Um, and so a lot of innovation is going on right now um, across the board, not only in Silicon Valley and places like that, but also in um, the context of national governments, where governments are increasingly thinking, right, you know, what can we learn from some of the technological advances we've seen in the private sector? And what technologies can we use to modernize our statistical systems and methods and have a better handle? And some examples of that kind of data are using satellite imagery. So using aerial images of the earth to have a much better understanding of infrastructures. So where are their built dwellings, for example, and then triangulating that with population data to figure out, you know, where are the population, where do they live um, and, and kind of come up with more uh, robust, timely estimates of population change. So there's a lot of innovations like that, you know, satellite data using telecommunications data, um, citizen generated data, like people literally going out and counting how many birds they see in that given area. And so, so there's loads of different innovations and um, they all represent huge opportunities, but there are also a lot of challenges associated with these kinds of data partnerships, um, as I'm sure we'll come on to in a bit. Yeah. Um, Patrice, Statistics Canada's role in um, the SDGs um, is, is quite significant. They're, they're really leading the way for the government here in terms of um, uh, measuring progress um, to be able to then build on that. So I'm curious, you've been at Stats Canada for a while, and I'm curious to know um, what, um, how the organization is approaching uh, these goals differently than it has um, in the past in terms of um, collecting, analyzing, and reporting on data? How has the organization had to adapt in order to try to meet these really ambitious um, targets? Thank you for the excellent question. Um, so for the SDG, like I would say it's kind of a, a project, a special project uh, different. Uh, 
in, in general, like that, can we use a, a diversity of sources of data? We use admin data, we use surveys, we have the census. Uh, one major difference for this one is we have to report for a, a wide range of, uh, of goals. And sometimes the data are not produced by StatCan itself. So uh, we're collaborating with other organizations like other department or international organization to have data. And we have to ensure that the data that we present like in our SDG data hub, where we present like the progress made for the, the different indicators, we have to make sure that they are good quality and they, that they measure like adequately like the indicator because uh, we don't want to uh, mislead like anybody. So that's one of the challenges that we have had. Also, uh, we have different sources, like we have the, what we call like the traditional data, the census as an example, it's a, it's a major source of information. Uh, it can it allow for a lot of disaggregation in terms of geography and also like a uh, different population. The only problem is in Canada, we collect it like every five years, which means that between now and uh, 2030, we have two more census. Mm. Uh, is that enough to track everything and to make sure that we're doing the progress and we are on, on the right track? Uh, we probably need like uh, other uh, data to complement that. Um, it's interesting because the, the the situation we're in right now with the COVID-19, uh, StatCan has uh, tried like new method of, uh, of surveying. Like we have done uh, some crowdsourcing as an example. Uh, we're also like exploring like new kind of data that are less traditional, like uh, qualitative data, but also like perception data. Uh, in terms of poverty as an example, we used to have like a, a poverty threshold uh, and we say like, okay, if you're above this threshold, you're not poor. And if you are below it, you're poor. Uh, mm -hmm. But there are more to that. Like maybe there is like also the perception of the people. Like do you feel that you're able, like do you feel you have enough money and enough resource to uh, do everything you, you, you have to do, like to, uh, to have a nice like uh, housing and uh, uh, that you have like a full security and everything. So we're trying to explore that. I think that we have to keep in mind that this is really, really important is uh, we have to make sure from a statistical point of view that data are representative of, of the situation. Uh, and I will give you like two, two, uh, two easy examples to understand that. Like if I want to measure that uh, the, the use of uh, internet by Canadian, I want to know like percentage of Canadians who are, are connected. If I do an online survey, there is a huge bias at the beginning because for sure people who will answer it are already on the internet. So I'm missing a big part of the population who are not using the internet. Or uh, if I want to know like how much physical activity do Canadians do and I do a quick survey to my bike club, for sure I will probably like overestimate like the, the physical activity. So we have to be really careful with that. We have to make sure that uh, the, the methodology, methodology are uh, statically sound and uh, representative of the population. Right. Uh, Jonathan, welcome. We can see you now. Um, thank you, Patrice. So that's, um, that's, that's really interesting. And I find, you know, when we talk about um, being able to capture all of these populations, that's, that's core to achieving these goals, right? And leave no one behind. Um, so I'm, if we're approaching, um, if you know we're failing to um, capture you know some of the most vulnerable populations um, that you know many of these uh, goals are intended to 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 help, then um, that seems like a glaring uh, gap in in some of these strategies. Um, but in, interesting to see how um, how we're trying to work through those. And I I want to go to Jonathan to talk a bit about that because. Um, I understand, you know, a lot of the work that you do aims to address um, these gaps with regards to First Nations. So tell us a bit about that. What considerations go into data collection and use um, among First Nations and how do you coordinate that um, among, you know, the many communities uh, and diverse communities across Canada? Okay, thank you for that. First, I'm going to check that you can see and hear me. We can hear you, yeah. Okay, so you can uh, I've had a hell of a time trying to join you today, but uh, here I am. Uh, yeah, thanks for the question. I mean, I think it's essential to start with first the name of our organization and the vision of the organization because there are essential components built into those two things. So we're known as the First Nations Information Governance Center. So information governance and governance more broadly is central to what, uh, to what you're asking about here. And then the vision that our national board has given us as an organization um, is that we envision every First Nation achieving data sovereignty in alignment with its distinct worldview. 
So our focus very much is uh, information in the context of data sovereignty. So having the essential necessary information to do what needs to be done with, but at the same time ensuring that it's, uh, it is done within this context of First Nations exerting sovereignty over that information. Um, and how do you do that? Well, you do it through good governance. And so it's not just about information governance, broadly speaking. And when I talk about data sovereignty, people internationally in mainstream contexts, not just indigenous contexts, but mainstream contexts, they understand notions of information governance and they understand notions of uh, uh, sovereignty from nation perspectives. What a lot of uh, audiences don't understand though is the historic reality of First Nations, the contemporary realities of First Nations. Um, and in the context of Canada, First Nations are in a nation to nation or nation to nation relationships with the Crown or the nation of Canada. And so we have the right to exert sovereignty broadly and then information sovereignty within that broader sovereignty context. So our national organization has a very focused mandate. Uh, we have for 20 plus years been designing and implementing with regional partners across the country, the longstanding and influential First Nations Regional Health Survey. Since then, we've expanded to do other national surveys on reserve and in Northern First Nations communities. And we also have been given the mandate to do related research that supports the priorities that come out of those national surveys. And then we have a very important education and training mandate. And education and training is certainly around um, the work that we do in information governance and First Nations approaches to good information collection, good analysis, good dissemination or knowledge translation. Um, but it's also around the very specific approaches that we take in our work and that we encourage others to learn uh, so they can be the best partner with First Nations, regardless of the nature of the relationship, whether it's a nation to nation relationship or a researcher to community relationship or a government to community relationship or what have you. The principles that we uphold uh, as a national organization on behalf of First Nations are what, what are known as the OCAP principles. And that's an acronym that stands for ownership, control, access, and possession. So as a national organization, we uphold those principles, but it is rights holding First Nations that can determine how those principles are defined and ultimately implemented on the ground. And um, that's the key to unlocking uh, the appropriate path to success um, that is captured within our vision statement, this idea of First Nations achieving data sovereignty in alignment with their distinct worldview. Because there is this incredible diversity uh, across and within First Nations in Canada, there's a need to ensure that rights holding First Nations determine what it means to own, control, access, and have possession of their own information, and what it means for others to come to them and determine what a working relationship is. And you do that via agreement um, and all the tools that we know uh, in this space of information governance and information management and research. So really in a nutshell, uh, so much of what we do is captured in the, in the name of the organization and that vision. And I, I expect we'll come back to some of these issues as we talk as a, as a panel and, uh, and with uh, the participants. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm curious, um, globally, when we talk about uh, data governance, um, like how important is the local context? Jessica, maybe you can answer this question. What considerations do policymakers uh, and private organizations have to be making here as well? Um, so how important is the local context in, in kind of international data governance? I mean, uh, hugely, I, I think, when we're saying when we're talking about international data governance so when you're thinking about um the sharing of information between two entities or more entities um and how that that data transfer that data um exchange is managed um that can happen at multiple levels you can be talking internationally like the who sharing health data um with different countries for example or vice versa um or you can be talking about the European Union trying to negotiate with all European telecommunications companies for them to share certain telco data with, with Europe. But you can also be talking about, you know, the most micro level exchanges. You could be talking about um, 
individuals generating citizen generated data for their community on biodiversity or plant life and finding ways to share that with the national government um, and to do so safely and respectfully and whatever level you're operating at many of the same principles apply um, and I think those are obviously that you need to have respect for the individual's rights over that information and data um, first and foremost, particularly if it concerns their, their personal data or micro data, as we call it, um, they need to be informed, they need to be engaged, uh, they need to know how that data is going to be used, handled and stored. Uh, many of the principles that are, of course, captured in the European uh, GDPR, um, but more so than that as well. I think a key thing that's been missing in a huge number of uh, these conversations about data governance is um, an effort to really uh, bring the general public in, you know, not just um, quasi experts trying to make decisions about people's rights or not. I think we need to actually have a much more open civic conversation about you know, what are you and aren't you comfortable about uh, with and how do you want that information to be communicated? And also, do you fully understand how that data is going to be used? I mean, I think so many times, um, you know, if you ask an older relative, um, are you happy with your mobile phone data being used to help track your movements for COVID? They'll say, oh yeah, sure, absolutely. That's, that sounds very reasonable. But what's not factoring into people's understanding is that once you've shared that information with the government or you've given permission to the telecommunications provider to harness that information, when does it stop, right? When, when is COVID over? It might be with us for, for eternity, like flu. Um, you know, when does the mobile phone operator or the private or, or the government have to stop collecting and, and saving that information? And those are really important conversations that need to be had at every level, uh, right down to you know every individual. Um, and and sadly, um, it's been very sidelined um, over the last few years of kind of political policy discussions. Um, the technologists are moving miles ahead of uh, public policy and law. And we're struggling to keep up. Um, but I think one thing that the COVID epidemic has really done is bring many of these data issues to the forefront. You know, we're seeing a lot of press articles, a lot of coverage, a lot of discussion um, at the multinational and national level and local levels about, you know, well, what information is being collated? How is my health data being reported? You know, is, are we using tele telecommunications data to track stuff? And that is slowly making everyone a bit more informed about the fact that there are you know, profound repercussions to how we use all this information and how we harness it. So, um, yeah, hugely, hugely important area and applicable at every level. Um, but at the moment, I think the big focus is just trying to get the national policy frameworks right so that um, there are good overarching um, safety, security, responsible and ethical data use guidelines that, you know, are applied in every country around the world um, within which private operators and public operators have to work. Right. It, yeah, it, it seems like the COVID-19 epidemic is in some ways solving that piece of getting um, getting these discussions out into the mainstream and out of um, just academia and uh, expert conversations. Um, so, uh, but yeah, understood the policy and governance side of it still needs to be. Well, it's a bit naive, but I'm hoping that this is going to come out as one of the build back better areas of, of work, right? That as we come out of the epidemic um, and that more people will be engaged with these issues, there'll be more um, discussion about data governance and information and, and, you know, it's strengthening the quality of our health data systems and so on, that this actually might become a central topic yeah. um, in national and, you know, every level of governance dialogues. So we'll see. Yeah. Um, I'm, we have a couple uh, audience questions here. I'm going to uh, take some of those now. So um, Alex Todd asked, how useful would it be to have citizen generated personal commitments based behavior change data collected via SMS? Uh, any, any thoughts on that? <laughs> I don't know if anyone else wants to jump in. I mean, I think it's an interesting question um, uh, around behavior change. So for example, you reporting personally that you're now recycling or rep reporting personally that you're now composting and you know all organic materials are no longer going to landfill. You know, I think there's a lot of things like that that could be really interesting to have reported, but um, to make sure that people are doing it well, that it's collected effectively, 
that it's um, done, you know, in a, in, with a rigorous method so that it's actually comparable is quite a big effort. So, um, yeah, it's a great idea, but I think a lot of capacity and, and thinking and, and engagement on behalf of the national statistical officers like StatsCan would have to go in to make sure that it's actually useful to inform policy. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, another question here for Stats uh, Can. Uh, Amon is wondering, uh, can we have access to data from Statistics Canada about the SDGs? SDGs is that all public? Yes, we have a SDG data hub. I can share the the uh, the web the website after the, the address. But we definitely like have a, a public uh, website uh, that presents like the result, the latest result, uh, the the best source, uh, also like uh, historical data. So yes, we have something public for uh, all the SDGs. Um, also, Patrice, I know um, the SDGs are meant to be politically neutral, um, but you know when you're sifting through data, it's possible to uncover information that may not be um, the most flattering for a country. And so, I'm curious to know um, how Statistics Canada, um, while working so closely with the federal government, ensures that information gathering um, and reporting is politically neutral? That's an excellent question, thank you. So I would say for that, like uh, Statistics Canada has treated like the SDG project as any other project. And uh, as you probably know, like uh, Statistics Canada wants to be like a neutral, present information in a neutral way. Uh, we usually have a, a calendar when we present like the information that we collect. Uh, so in that sense, like uh, we, we have just make sure that we report good quality data based on sound and transparent methodology. And if the indicators look good or bad, like uh, for us, it's not our, 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 um, it's not our role to decide. Uh, our role is to present information the way it is. So we have presented like uh, information, we have reported on all indicators uh, for which we have data, regardless of if the results are good or not. So that's, uh, that's the way we have seen our role. And I think it's the, it's the best way to do. Uh, if you look like the commitment for the, the role of the data in the SDG, uh, they always talk about like transparent reporting is really, really important. And the role of the, the NSO uh, is, is key to that, to, uh, to report data like in, uh, in a neutral way. Um, sorry, getting a couple notes from listeners. Uh, I can hear Patrice, uh, Jessica, and Jonathan, uh, question. Some folks are saying they can't hear Petrice. Um, so I'm not sure. Uh, okay. Uh, I'm not sure if it's a, maybe an interpretation, if it has to do with whether you're using the interpretation button. I, I don't know. Uh, maybe just volume. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, moving on then. Um, so Jonathan, um, I, I want to go to you um, to talk a bit about um, just generally in bearing in mind the diversity between um, First Nations and Canada, but generally speaking from your conversations um, and observations, what is the sense of the utility of the SDGs for First Nations um, and um, interest in adopting them? It's a, it's a really good question. I mean, before I answer that, I'll just quickly move back to what uh, uh, Jessica was saying earlier. And I, uh, I want to uh, put down one more important distinction when we're talking about uh, the First Nations work in these spaces. Uh, individual rights, privacy are absolutely essential. Um, but in Canada, we also have this issue of collective rights around information, right? So um, that's, a, that's an area where uh, Canadian law is really inadequate in terms of uh, what First Nations needs and aspirations are around their ability to be sovereign around their collective right to information. So where information identifies a nation, First Nation, uh, or a community or communities within that nation context, there is the right for that information to be held by that collective. And then of course, individuals have rights uh, as well within that context as citizens of that First Nation. Um, so in, in terms of the question about the SDGs, it, you know, it's interesting. Uh, we are mindful of the fact that uh, you know, we don't have a seat at the table uh, in the UN context uh, in the way that uh, Canada and other nation states do. We do know that Indigenous Canadian interests are represented at the, you know, via the seat that Canada does have at these kinds of tables, um, but it really is inadequate. So there's a need to ensure that uh, 
uh, First Nations in Canada are working well with Canadian partners, other partners internationally, especially Indigenous partners as well. You know, that being said, we pay very close attention to these kinds of bodies and the good work that can come out of these kinds of bodies. Um, in this case, the Sustainable Development Goals, I've certainly seen as a good place to start conversations if you need a tool to help you start a conversation. But this isn't to say that First Nations aren't thinking about, um, you know, the social determinants of health um, in very complex and meaningful ways. We have been for uh, uh, decades, certainly in my experience, and generations, I would argue, um, back to time immemorial, you know, if we were to, to think of it the way elders in our communities might think about it. That being said, First Nations in Canada, we have a lot of experience looking at what people are doing in Canada, in mainstream contexts, in Western contexts, uh, looking at what people are doing internationally, and determining whether there are uh, whether there is a desire to adopt what's been done, having uh, assessed it, uh, uh, adapt what we see, or having learned from it to turn to uh, developing our own approach to things. So I can give you a very concrete example in Canada. Um, First Nations are working with the government of Canada uh, to look at this question of the sustainable development goals um, and uh, the kinds of frameworks we might, we might need to have in place um, for uh, uh, an outcomes-based framework. And, you know, are the SDGs a good starting place? Well, they were in many contexts a good starting place for the conversation. What ultimately we've seen is we've done that, adopt, adapt, and or build approach to this. Um, in working through the uh, sustainable development goals, we've been able to identify where they don't work for First Nations, where they fail to capture First Nations views or worldview pers uh, perspectives on issues. And so there is an, uh, uh, an, an adaptation that we see, or even in some cases, the development of, uh, of new approaches to looking at these issues. So there's nothing wrong with First Nations, uh, you know, engaging with uh, what comes out of these groups of incredibly smart people. Um, but there really is the need to ensure that First Nations uh, have the opportunity and the resources, human and otherwise, um, to really be able to do the work that best befits the worldview of a First Nation or what First Nations, when we come together, choose to do collectively. So. Okay to start with. Uh, sometimes it's carried forward and sometimes it isn't. Um, we have a lot of experience with that in Canada. And certainly in my 20 years in uh, research and policy in this area, uh, I can say uh, I've seen it numerous times. Thank you. Um, okay, I'm gonna go to another question from the audience. Maria's asking um, if the panelists can speak to the importance of SDGs um, of having a coordinated a uh, set of indicators and data collected by local governments at the urban uh, city level. Um, I, I'll just jump in quickly on this. So at SDSN, uh, we uh, rather presumptuously back in 2015 kicked off a program looking at local implementation of the SDGs before the SDGs were even <laughs> agreed. Um, so uh, we started running it in 2015 and it's been running until quite recently. Obviously loads of cities around the world have started thinking about the relevance and applicability of the SDGs, but what we were trying to do is document their different approaches um, to um, basically how you how you use the SDG framework. Um, as, John's, as Jonathan's already alluded to, the SDGs were negotiated by um, nation states, 193 member states of the UN. Um, and so there were very few, but there were almost no other communities that were actively engaged that you know some representatives spoke representing different stakeholders but no one else had voting rights and so cities and local governments uh, likewise didn't have any kind of influence over the shape of the the outcome document not in any substantive political terms and yet here we are with an agenda which is um in you know hugely relevant to urban communities and and subnational levels of government particularly as you know 70 percent of the world population is soon going to be living in urban environments um and yet they didn't have a hand in sort of developing it uh to some you know some cities take the view of well that means it's not relevant and helpful and so on but actually the vast majority of local governments that i've engaged with over the last five years particularly have actually said that they found the sdgs a really helpful framework for starting a dialogue about what is sustainable development and what does it mean for our community um 
and providing a unifying language um, of kind of what are the different terms, uh, what are the different aspects of sustainable development, how do you conceptualize it? And then off the back of that conversation, identifying local metrics to try and um, monitor performance. Um, obviously, it can be helpful when those metrics align with the national government's data sets, um, but I've, in the conversations I've had with local governments, that's really not been the primary purpose. Um, most of the, the data and statistics that's required for SDG reporting is national anyway. So it's much more about just trying to help galvanize progress using whatever me monitoring methods seem most appropriate and most contextually relevant um, for that given local community. Um, so they've certainly, uh, the cities and local government regions that I've been in touch with have, have found it a really useful framework, but not necessarily from a sort of data perspective, much more from a um, kind of yeah, unifying uh, policy framework. Um, but that's not to say in some cases, obviously, the data they generate isn't incredibly useful for the national government and for their reporting. But I'm sure Patrice would have a lot more to say on this. Your answer was really good, but um, me, I, I can add, like, uh, in terms of coordination, a thing that is important as well is uh, comparison. Like, I know you're not supposed to compare with the SDG, but sometimes you want to make sure, like, the concepts used are, are, are the same, because if you want to know, like, if you're progressing well or... Um, and it's not really tied to data, but I think it's important to, like, a thing that we have seen with the different places, like, in the discussion is the adoption of good practice. Uh, what works. So in terms of coordination, like me, I think it's good to share like the, the data, the results and to see what works, what doesn't work, what could be like used in, in a different context. Uh, I, I see a lot of uh, pot potential collaboration in that. And I think that is really, really important. Like we have sometimes like good things that, that work really well and then we can reuse or things that didn't work that well that we should not re reuse. But uh, I see a, a good potential with that. Okay, uh, we haven't talked much about um, progress on the SDGs to date. Um, so it's been five years, about 10 more years uh, to go to meet the 2030 deadline set by the UN. Um, what, what have we seen in terms of progress in reaching these goals? Um, this question for any of the panelists, if you wanna jump in. Maybe we can go to Patrice first um, and talk to us about progress that we've seen uh, in Canada. So, yeah, we can definitely talk about the progress. Uh, so it started in 2015. Uh, sometimes we don't have data for 2015, so it's difficult to see. And what is also interesting is sometimes we can see progress, but it could just happen because it happened like naturally, like in, in one sense or, or the other. So it's really important to uh, also like assess like what what is the source of the of the progress or what has been done to uh, to to make the progress to to see like was it like a policy or a change in, in the habits of the people uh, so and and as you can see like there is a wide range so we there are somewhere like uh, where uh, we can have like a, an easy uh, view like goal number one poverty is an example one of the major uh, indicator is the the percentage of the population uh, living the official national uh, poverty line in Canada so we have seen like different measures that add an impact and we have seen this uh, this uh, this indicator like uh, going down uh, recently uh, now we are in a special situation is it going to, to change or to go up again uh, I, I don't have data with me but uh, uh, this one was definitely on the, the, the right track. There are some others that are more difficult to track or take more time. I'm talking about like uh, sometimes the environment. I think we just published uh, the 2018 results for the greenhouse gas emission. Uh, so there is kind of a two years delay. Uh, so it is difficult to see and difficult to see what, what works and what has a, an impact. So I, I can talk like for uh, probably like uh, hours and hours about like indicator by indicator, but if you look, go look at the SDG data hub that we have, uh, we propose at StatCAD, you can see like the, the trend and we have like usually more than one year. So you can see like what is moving to the right direction and what is not moving. But what is really important to me, and I, I want to highlight that again is uh, what has been done. Like, is it like a, a fluke that is going in the right direction or uh, is it like the, 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 the change that we have done uh, to adapt to the SDG that have, uh, have uh, changed the, the trajectory or the, the trend? Yeah, how do we, um, you know, ensure that governments in 
uh, nations are taking what they're learning through all of this data um, they're collecting and actually using it to inform policies and programs that can help achieve these goals. Um, Jonathan, I don't know if you have some insight into that. Yeah, this is going to sound like a bit of a dodge to the question, but I think there's an important point to, to insert here uh, from a First Nations perspective. Again, the, the, so, uh, the SDGs are not ours, um, mm -hmm. but they can be a useful tool for us, and we're certainly working with our government uh, partners at the federal, provincial, territorial level on the utility of, of using the SDGs uh, to look at frameworks and indicators and, uh, and the approaches that we have. Um, I'd, I'd like to share something that I shared with uh, my fellow panelists when we spoke last week, which is this idea that in Canada, uh, we're often focused on this gap, the gap that exists between First Nations and non-First Nations people in Canada. Um, and uh, my colleague, Mindy Denny out of Nova Scotia, uh, a Mi'kmaq data champion, um, has this beautiful quote that she uses around this idea of a gap. And uh, for her and, and uh, the, the citizens of the Mi'kmaq Nation, and for many First Nations people across Canada, I think it's safe to say that, uh, uh, as she says, the gap that we're interested in closing is not the gap between us and non-First Nations people. The gap is really, um, what's the distance between where you are and where Creator intended you to be? And what's the work that we need to do to close that gap? And if that brings up your, uh, uh, you know, your uh, health and well-being and that of your family and your community and your nation, um, then that's a, a beautiful approach that I think Canadians uh, can think about uh, as well. Um, there is an important role in closing socioeconomic gaps, absolutely, and we're not talking about uh, uh, discounting that in any way. But this important change that we've seen and therefore progress, and the SDGs are a small part of helping progress in this area is in the nation-to-nation -nation relationship, Canada and First Nations are talking about the importance of looking at gap closure through First Nations worldviews. And I think Mindy's quote beautifully encapsulates uh, a Mi'kmaq view as she articulates it. I think that's a good place, as good as any, to um, end our conversation. Um, if you do want to continue uh, chatting about this, um, you can see in the Zoom chat at the bottom of your page, there's a link to um, a coffee chat, which you can uh, go and continue the conversation there. Um, so thank you again, everyone, for tuning in um, and listening and asking your questions. And to all the panelists, thank you so much for your insights on this. Really appreciate it.